It's Game Boy Works, and everybody's gone to the moon. Out of tune. Everyone's gone to the moon. Eyes full of sorrow. Well, it's our pals from pac Video again, and they've given us another fascinating release. pac Video didn't really trade in good games, but at least everything they made was interesting. In this case, they've given us what will almost certainly be the oldest game ever to show up on Game Boy. We've seen plenty of 70s vintage works pop up on Game Boy, including the likes of Space Invaders and our beloved Heian Kyo Alien, but Lunar Lander stretches all the way back to the dim and distant year of 1969. It's the only Game Boy release ever conceived while the Beatles were still together, and since Pong only came up for Game Boy Color, this is also the only original model Game Boy work ever to have been created while Nixon was president. I'm pretty sure this is the only Game Boy game whose original version appeared before I was born. In short, this game is old. Of course, Lunar Lander for Game Boy barely resembles the original iteration of the game, which a high school student by the name of Jim Storer created for the room-sized mini-computers of the year 1969. That original iteration took the form of a text-based exercise similar to the earliest versions of Oregon Trail. Back in 1969, of course, video games didn't even really exist. So the mere novelty of typing words into a computer and having it return some sort of constructive descriptive text was novel. And it makes perfect sense for Landing on the Moon to have captured the public's interest at the time. Lunar Lander was a chance for nerds everywhere, or at least the ones with access to a PDP-8 computer, to live out a simulation of the actual moon landing that was happening on television in real time. This game of course barely resembles that primitive mini-computer creation, even if the gaming audiences of 1990 had the same tolerance and awe for text-based games as they did in 1969, the Game Boy didn't precisely lend itself to text entry. Instead, pac -In Video's release had more in common with Atari's arcade version of the game, which debuted a full decade after the original. Pack and Video didn't license the game, however. It appears that Lunar Lander's fuzzy origins as an academic work left it without a firm trademark or copyright. And once Atari adapted the concept to a graphical version, the clones began flooding in. I suppose then this would be one of those clones. But clocking in a full decade after the Atari game's arcade heyday, this doesn't simply reproduce the stand-up version's design. Pack and Video greatly expanded on the concept of Lunar Lander, to the point that the part people think of as Lunar Lander constitutes a minority of the Game Boy experience. The classic Lunar Lander game is here, but you kind of have to work for it. The original concept behind Lunar Lander was all right there in the title. Players had to guide a lunar excursion module safely to the surface of the moon. It was an exercise in physics modeling and math, really, as your task involved using a lot of counterthrust to nudge the LEM safely to the ground by negating its descent and minimizing its horizontal shear. Atari turned this into a vector-based game with a control setup similar to the one that would appear the following year in Asteroids. Players had only four controls to work with, buttons to rotate their LEM clockwise or counterclockwise, an abort button, and a very satisfying thrust handle that could be pushed forward or pulled down to adjust the power of the LEM's retro rockets. The Game Boy release obviously couldn't incorporate that huge analog lever, so pac -In Video did the next best thing. They added new modes. The original Lunar Lander element of the game appears here, but it's the second of a three-phase game experience. This makes for a pretty weird take on Lunar Lander. It starts out with a seeming emphasis on a realistic launch and landing experience, but once you touch down, the whole thing takes a swerve into kooky fantasy. Before you can land your module, you need to complete the game's first phase, which is naturally enough a launch sequence. This involves helping a space shuttle break orbit by holding an optimal course and building up engine pressure. It's a pretty simple sequence, though not wholly intuitive. As the shuttle ascends, it wanders out of the sweet spot in the center of the screen, and you need to nudge it back into place with the D-pad. That much seems pretty obvious right away. What doesn't immediately present itself is that the central play mechanic here is actually to mash on the A button as quickly as possible to keep engine pressure in its optimal state. This mode presents you with three meters, fuel, compression, and altitude. 
and your objection is to max out the altitude meter before the fuel meter drops to zero. The shuttle only gains altitude when the pressure meter is in the critical zone though, and the only way to keep pressure up is to hit A as quickly as possible while the shuttle is in its sweet spot. Once you work that out, the shuttle enters orbit and you're given your choice of targets to explore on the lunar surface. It's here that the real game begins, though it's over in almost no time at all. Each lunar landing site has a slightly different layout than the rest, but your objective is always the same. Descend safely to the near surface zone, then touch down gently on one of the targets. Some landing zones have multiple landing targets, though the higher the point value of a target, the more difficult it is to put down there without smashing into a rock overhang or something. This part plays like the classic concept of Lunar Lander, and your options are about the same as ever. You can rotate your LEM in either direction, though the controls work in reverse of how you'd probably expect, and you tap the A button to generate thrust. Unlike the older versions of the game, there does appear to be some small amount of friction and resistance, so it's easier to counteract your lateral drift than in classic Lunar Lander. The biggest hazard here comes from the meteorites that fall randomly, constantly, and unpredictably as you attempt to touch down. There's no way to know when they're going to appear, and there's no time to move out of their way. So they amount to a randomized, instant kill threat that can literally end your game before you know what's happening. So that's fun. Considering it is the heart of the game though, the actual landing portions go by pretty quickly. It's what happens after you land that makes pack-in videos take on Lunar Lander so bizarre. Once on the surface, your goal is to go foraging for mineral deposits. At the same time, you need to avoid, uh, moon men, I guess. Yeah, for some reason the game takes a total swerve here and shifts from being a fairly straight-laced take on the sciency aspects of the moon landing, and has you dodging marauding beasts on the lunar surface. I mentioned Heiyankyo Alien earlier, and this portion of the game will likely remind you of that. Maybe this is meant to be some sort of grand unifying theory between two classic computer games. Centuries ago, the aliens invaded Kyoto, and now we're looting their home. Who knows? Anyway, this portion of the game plays out through a top-down view and allows you to roam a few screens away from your LEM in search of resources to take back to Earth. The moon monsters aren't deadly, they don't actively seek you out, and they only sap 20% of your air supply if you make contact with them. As a peaceful astronaut, you're armed only with a surface drill that allows you to dig into the ground either to the left or right. And unlike in, say, Dig Dug, the drill doesn't double as a weapon. Your digging efforts create pits on the lunar surface, which you can fill back in. These create obstacles for both you and the lunar citizens you encounter, but there's no trap em up element. The moon critters will simply change direction once they bump into a hole. Occasionally digging into the ground will reveal some sort of weird Pac-Man flower thing. The flowers don't pose any sort of threat, they just sit there making harmless chomping motions. But they do create a permanent barrier that you have to navigate around. The digging process isn't totally blind. Your astronaut is also equipped with a metal detector that starts to emit sound when a buried resource is near. When you pass directly over the mineral, the sound becomes intense and high-pitched, so there's no aimless wandering that needs to be done. You just need to keep an ear open, or an eye if you prefer, since the sound is accompanied by a change to the detector icon along the bottom of the screen. Once you've acquired enough resources, a 30 second timer kicks in and you have to scramble back to the LEM before it runs out. If you can make it safely, you launch back into orbit and select another landing site. And that's about it, really. Lunar Lander for Game Boy is a more involved game experience than Lunar Lander for PDP-8 or arcades, but it's still pretty straightforward and to the point. At the same time, it's also a rather drawn-out game experience. The game allows password continues, but you have to clear all eight landing sites in a mission in order to get one, and that accounts for nearly an hour of playtime. It's not really Game Boy friendly. But still, Lunar Lander is remarkable simply for existing. It's the oldest game we'll ever see on Game Boy, unless there is an official conversion of computer space I'm not aware of, and it's also the most elaborate rendition of this ancient work. Lunar Lander never came to the US, which makes it another one of those fascinating blips of history lurking in the uncharted regions of the Game Boy Galaxy. Someone alert Commander Shepard.
Next on Game Boy Works, Sunsoft returns to race for the grand prize. <laughs> 